Hi guys, this is episode number 10. Um, yeah, we made it so far and I'm very happy to have a special episode where I brought in my Fender. Um, I had my Fender Super Reverb there, but it wasn't so good. The bass main was the more convincing Fender today and my GDM 45. So we will look into a few classic tones today. One of them is the very famous Oops, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. And this is the poster from the show that I actually have attended in 1984 when I was a teenager. And um, there are some remarkable memories about that night. It was loud. Um, and also I want to catch up with some ACDC tones. And of course, if you do have some questions, please um, write to us on the email or under the stream so we know what you want us to talk about. But tonight I have a super very special guest from the UK, from Newcastle. This is Mr. Paul Rose and we share a CD we are both on which is the Strat Kings. Um, Paul, can you hear me? I got one. Ah. Ah, I'm fine. Hey, good. Good. Last time we met was in Frankfurt at the beginning of the year, just shortly before the Corona crisis uh, started. And you, you, you've been starting the tour with a band of friends. And how many gigs could you actually do? <laughs> oh, at least. Good. Right, yeah. Ah. Hey, Paul, 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 we need your audio. We need your audio. Maybe your mic is still off. Hello, can you hear me now? Can, yeah, okay, now we can hear you. So, again, back to the question. The, the guys couldn't hear you. So, uh, um, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, we did, we did 10 dates out of, uh, we have a 60 date tour, 60 right. shows. Yeah. And the first run was 12 dates and we managed to do 10 of the 12 dates. Um, we now have 60 shows again because more uh, promoters and venues have confirmed. Cool. The problem that we have is as we, it yeah. looks like it's going to be 2021, which yeah. is... Yeah kind of boring but I, th I think we'll be back on the road before the end of 2020 at least yeah I, I hope so. a few a few shows uh, at the end of the year would be nice i i think so yeah yeah i think i saw your first show with that band in frankfurt it was, it was co cool yeah i'm i mean um you know i have this kind of uh thing with the british um how would you call it the, the, the British rock guys and yeah. um, for me you know being the German guy that was influenced by Richie Blackmore we talked about Richie a lot in last episode and I will talk a little bit more in in detail um, after our interview because um, we had some comments from friends that even gave me deeper insight uh, yeah. beyond the stuff that we talked about with uh, Alex the in last episode but um, you know, from, from the German perspective, I had, um, I had Richie Blackmore, I had, um, you know, Brian May, and I had Peter Green, um, and, um, and some American guys. But for me, you know, the, the British guys, Eric Clapton, they, they had a certain taste. They had a certain unique style, in a way. And yeah. um, how do you feel about that, you know, coming from over there? <laughs> how do well, you I see feel, it? I, f I feel proud of it. I yeah. feel very proud that 
the Beatles are from you know 180 miles down the road and, and, yeah. and Alan Holdsworth is from 100 miles down the road wow you know and John McLaughlin's from 60 miles down the road yeah so and Peter Green's from East London Eric Clapton's from uh, I can't remember where uh, he, he's kind of close to Gifford I heard you know where Anderton's yes, is west. yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah out west um why that is, I, I don't know. I mean, Jeff Beck, Peter Green, Eric Clapton, John McLaughlin, Alan Holdsworth, Robin Troa, uh, and countless, th there are countless guys out there. Um, mm. Yeah. Angus Young, Ang Angus Young's from Glasgow. Ah, from really? Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's not talk about, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, so there is this amazing kind of heritage and, I don't know why that is. There's actually an interview with Ron Wood from the Stones, and he's he's talking yeah. about Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton. Right. And he's saying, how could two guys at the same time from basically the same city yeah. happen? Yeah. Uh, uh, the the only other thing I can think of is you've got like Danny Gatton and Roy Buchanan in Washington D.C., Baltimore, very yeah. close by to each other. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. World-beating players. Of course, there's millions of great players in America. Sure. Um, but. Peter Frampton was, was, a, was a great player who, who, you know, Peter Frampton got me into serious adult music rather than kind of the 70s pop mm -hmm. stuff of Sweet and all of that, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with Sweet. But then I heard Blackmore on the radio at like midnight one night in here in Newcastle and it was Black Knight from the, the Made in Japan sessions, you know. Yeah. And it was it was the most extraordinary experience. It was like people had. It was like I was getting an electric shock. I you know? can I, yeah yeah I can imagine killer. I was like, what's this? You know, it was so revolutionary. And he's he's a king. You know. He's yeah yeah. About it. He's the best of the best. Yeah, and um, you know, for me, uh, there's a there's a certain style from the guys coming from the UK. Is it? Right. I don't know if all these cats met in the pubs playing in the scene and kind of watched each other and mm -hmm. had kind of a little bit of common ground and then still did their own thing in a way or yeah. how, how yeah. was, I mean, you know, here in the Saarland area where I live in, in, in Germany, we have a little bit of that going on in the amplifier scene. <laughs> That's funny because we have a, we have a, a, a few amp or pedal manufacturers and um, uh, we are not feeling like competitors in a way, but um, right. it is um, it is uh, something. Um, yeah, we, we share knowledge, and there's an energy that that kind of makes us strive a bit more. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, by the yeah, hey, yeah. but by, by the one, one one thing, Harry says uh, we need five dB more of your voice. Can you get closer to the How's mic? That? <laughs> How's that? Hello, hello, hello. Are you one two, one two. More, more, That's more, it? more. Even a bit more. more. Even more. More, more, more. Yeah, more we we more. want to hello, hear you, hello, Paul. Hello. Besser, besser. Yeah, besser. Yeah. How you is? got it? Yeah, I love it. Sehr gut. Yeah. Very. The, the good. Germans are excited. Besser. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, I'm sorry about that. I hope everybody could hear what I said. No, no, say we, it all we, again we still, if you want. No, no, no. We, we, we got you, but it's uh, just to make it perfect. Um, so when, yeah. when, w with this kind of scene going on in the 60s and 70s, at what mm -hmm. time did you kind of enter the scene and how did you connect with the guys or, with, or what was your story? Well, I mean, I, I, I grew up in, in 1970s Newcastle, which is... Uh, it's a different city to the city that it is today. It's, right. it's changed for the better. It really has changed for ah, the better, but okay. it was it's very much a working class kind of, uh, not a lot of rich people here, mm -hmm. um, mining, uh, shipbuilding, uh -huh. uh, very working class kind of city, you know. Right. Um, and I was just kind of like watching the TV, watching a show here called Top of the Pops, and there was a band that called The Sweet, who I'm sure Sweet were massive in Germany yeah, as well. Yeah, you absolutely, know. yeah, Borrow Blitz. Totally, they, they did a live album called Strung Up, right, and it had, I mean, it was an extremely exciting experience hearing yeah. a guitar feedback for the first time. It was right. sweet, you know, a live sweet album. Yeah. And then I heard Frampton Comes Alive, and oh, yeah. that kind of moved me into more of a mature musical style, I suppose you could say. And like I said before, then I heard Blackmore. 
and and Blackmore fried me. It was just superb. Then yeah. I heard Hendrix. Oh, then yeah. I saw Johnny Winter on Johnny Winter on British television. Yeah. And and then I heard Frank Zappa, and then it went on and on and on. But yeah. over the years, accumulatively, uh, Blackmore, Robin Troa, Rory Gallagher, Wow, um, Clapton, Peter Green, all of these guys. Um, there was something about, uh, I mean, I used to play in the pubs in London all the time. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, when I was in my late teens, I was, I was a bit of a, I was a bit of a problem child. <laughs> but, yeah, <clears throat> well, well and, who is uh, But that's okay. Yeah, well, that's, it's in the past. But I was playing in London and it, there was this huge blues boom going on. Yeah. And, um, and I was, there's a guy called Paul Lamb, who's a harmonica player from here, okay. who uh, plays in Germany a lot. And his guitar player, John Whitehill, yeah. who uh, is an old friend of mine who I haven't seen for some time now, but he's a great blues player, Chicago style. Yeah. And he used to talk about Peter Green and B.B. King yeah. like there was nobody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at, 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 at that time, I was, I was kind of into Vi and Holdsworth and oh. stuff like that. Yeah, I'd I'd heard Steve Vai's flexible album that he did. Yeah. Having heard Steve Vai play for Frank Zappa, yeah, I thought this this is this is a genius. Yeah, yeah. and he was, and he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he did that solo album, and I kind of got caught up in that Steve Vai thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and a friend of mine went to the music library, like, yeah, I don't know how long ago, mm -hmm. and he got Deep Purple made in Japan out of the library. Yeah. And we hadn't listened to it for 20 years. Yeah. And we sat and listened to Deep Purple Made in Japan. And I, th and I said to myself, this is, this is why you started to play the guitar, Paul. Yeah. You know, not, <laughs> you know. not the Shred King uh, kind of thing uh, from Y. Yeah, I know. Because there's, there's a million guys doing that. And, and yeah. A, they're better than me at it. And B, it's not my cup of tea. And, I, yeah. and, and, and it, it wasn't satisfying. Mm -hmm. trying to be that guy you know mm -hmm. so Blackmore kind of brought me back into the blues after this kind of Steve Vai Alan Holdsworth I think Holdsworth's great I love Holdsworth yeah, yeah. I still listen to Holdsworth you know yeah and, I, and Steve Vai's a genius what more can you say you know and um what I did do was is I, I, I kind of spent a long time working on my technique I moved to London yeah I didn't know anybody yeah. I had an alcohol problem mm. and I would just sit in the house all day and play the guitar. Like literally four, five, six, seven hours a day. Wow. I had nowhere to go and I had no money and no friends yeah. in London. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so all I would do was sit and play the guitar and I got a technique together. Yeah. yeah. And I got all of the tapping stuff going on. Yeah. Um, and I would go and play in pubs in London and people used to say, oh man. Stop mm. with that tapping shit. Nobody wants to hear that tapping shit, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and I had kind of lost direction. Mm -hmm. But getting back into Blackmore and then rediscovering all of that stuff and, 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 and rediscovering, well, rediscovering B.B. King, but discovering Peter Green more or yeah. less for the first time. Right. Uh, it's, it suddenly hit me between the eyes. Like John would say, yeah. Like I said before, Peter yeah. Green and B.B. King, like there yeah. was nobody else. Yeah. He's right. Yeah, yeah. But I was too caught up in the craziness of it all to not to be able to see that. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I think it's a, a natural uh, step of progressing in a way. I mean, when you're mm. young, you are maybe, um, you, the, the, your attention is caught by flashy stuff more than anything yeah. else, you know. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you understand deep emotion you go back to the blues or you know yeah. that you know that you know mistreated by the purple i mean that's a blues oh. song you know in a way yeah, you yeah. know i mean yeah, and it, it and, and if you've been down you know what th these guys felt and you yeah. know that's the real deal energy and yeah. and and nothing no matter how flashy and how beautiful stuff is to me mm -hmm. has that kind of impact on my yeah. You know, getting goosebumps and, uh, you know, yeah. that, that kind of yeah. physical reaction. And this is what is, to me, the heart and soul of rock music or music in general. I mean, I can even listen to Bach pieces and, uh, sure. and, and, and then 
you know, there are so certain moments where it's unbelievable. You have to whatever, yeah. you yeah. know, you s <laughs> emotionally it <laughs> hits you. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. I have seen a picture um, with Rory Gallagher um, mm. in the back and you in the front. What, what was that <laughs> deal about? That was another, get back to this thing about trying to be a rock and roll star, which yeah. is kind of, uh, uh, that's all I was interested in. If, if I'm not a rock and roll star, I'm going to jump off the bridge. I'm going to jump under a bus, you know. <laughs> I can't live without being a rock and roll star. Yeah. And, and it, so I used to do things to try and draw attention to what I was doing. And I entered this Rory Gallagher competition. It was a Fender-sponsored guitar competition. Yeah. And a friend of mine saw it in the newspaper. And he says, oh, there's a competition going on in Newcastle. They're looking for people to go and play. And Rory Gallagher's going to judge. And the winner gets a Strat and an AC30. So oh, I said, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah, Let's do it. Let's go down there. So when I went down there, I expected Rory to be there. And he wasn't. It was just a video camera. Just like oh. this video camera right in front of me. Yeah. So they said, OK, you got to play that guitar. The guitar that you were going to win. The, 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 the Strat right. through the AC30. No distortion pedals, nothing. Yeah. So I can't remember what I played. I played some blues licks in G. I can't remember anything more about it than that. And I walked out of the place and I never really thought anything more about it. I wondered about it. I wondered. And then I got a phone call saying, oh, hello, this is this is Donald, Donald Gallagher. I'm, I'm the brother of Rory Gallagher. And I said, oh, hello. Okay. He says, you've won the competition. <laughs> so, wow. so he said, yeah. Can you, can you come to London and we'll give you the guitar and the amp? I says, okay. yeah, mm -hmm. of course I can. You know, so, and that photograph that you're talking about is me at Tower Records in Piccadilly Circus, ah, Central London. Getting the prize. And I'm getting the prize and Rory's standing watching me play as he's, he's just presented me with the guitar. Cool. So that's how that happened. I believe there was a thousand people entered, but... Yeah. And then the, the media in rock and roll has a, has a habit of exaggerating numbers. <laughs> and then you entered this other competition by Fender, you know, about the Strat King Awards in, when was this, yeah. in 2004? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, when, yeah. The, when the Strat became 50, you know, and yes. Yes. We, we both entered. And here's the funny story from my side is Fender, mm. the award should have been a 1954, you know, custom shop, high end, uh, whatever. Um, Right. Uh, uh, Strat, and I thought, mm -hmm. okay, if that's probably worth it. I didn't want to go there, but um, I had a, a, a webmaster at that time, and he forced me into that. I said, he he just finished my web website back then, and he said, you have to go mm -hmm. there. You play Strat all day, blah blah blah. You yeah. Know, so. yeah. And, and and he he literally made me uh, drop the uh, whatever uh, CD with your songs, mm -hmm. so they could mm -hmm. uh, to, for for entering. The very last day, we had to go to the post yes. office like 30 minutes before the deadline. Anyway, so right. I've done that, and blah, blah. And, the, the, and, and then we finally met in a rundle at this castle for the finals, you know. And That's right. That's I, right. I, I remember there was a German guy, Markus Demel, um, mm. and it was a bit windy. And he was trying to do the... Um, um, Steve Vai kind of show with with a coat mm. and with, with a hat and kind mm. of thing, and it was not the best day for him because it was British weather with kind of sunny, windy, uh, uh, and then the the hat fl flew from his head and probably that right. was costing him a few points. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and for for some reason I made it that day. You know, I had a good day for for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and um, I thought all the guitar players were killer and. Mm. Uh, this this is this was the first time I met you, and mm. I already was impressed. And then I saw you another time at Frankfurt when you demoed something, and I thought, man, this guy is killer, uh, and uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. I'm you know, Paul. I have to admit, you're the better player now. <laughs> this is after how many years? Doesn't matter. You 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 practice more than I did, and you deserve. I would give you the Strat King title now, so this is going to you. Um, anyway, this is. I'm very grateful for you to say that. Yeah. But if I if I could say, it, Thomas, you know, yeah. I won the Guitarist of the Year magazine competition as well, and yeah, in London. And 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 if I have to really, really be honest, and and I and I and I, and I really 
It doesn't. Yeah. None of it matters. It none of it matters. I, I, I mm. wake up in the morning and I put the kettle on and I make some coffee and I never think about these things. You I know? same here. I give a shit about it's it. It's today. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's more. Uh, what you need in your marketing package. So you, there's a label yes. for you. It's not like you're yeah. Mr. Nobody. You have a few prices and it's like if you're a doctor uh, or whatever professor and if you're a guitar player, a price does mm -hmm. help. But for me personally That's, or for you, yeah. I, I, you know, we do, we love the music and we give yeah. a shit about all that stuff. That's, That's not right. about it anyhow. We, we, we do, do it yeah. without a price, without any money we, because we, we love it. That's, <laughs> If we were doing, it, if I was doing it for money, Thomas, I would have, I would have stopped and got it and done something else. Sure. Uh, there, there is, there is nothing more satisfactory than the two things that I find most satisfactory. Right. Are sitting in the studio mixing a number when it's finished. Yeah. And 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 and, and the mix starting to come together, and you're like that last day of mixing, and it's a finished piece of music. Yeah there's nothing money can't buy that you know and playing live with the right musicians in the yeah. right venue with the right audience yeah it's unbeatable and uh, I don't need if I can keep doing that and maintain my health I don't need anything else I totally agree I'm totally the same you know it's it's mm. I mean maybe other people have the money but they have to spend tons of money to get something what they think is exciting I know yeah. the way you talk about your experience and I know the same with my experience playing with other musicians. If you have mm -hmm. this magic moments on stage or like in the studio, yeah. it's like, hey, this is, this is what life is for, you know? This is, that's what it is. That's yeah, what it that, is. That, that, yeah. that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question from a guy here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I try to read, maybe you can uh, t say something about that one. What's the importance of Oasis, Blur, Stone Roses and others to the British rock? Um, I think they smashed Nirvana, Pearl Jam and others in the US at the time. Well, this is going back to the 90s, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, I know, of course, uh, Blur, Oasis um, here in Germany. How, how was this thing in, in the U, UK? At the time, they were huge. At yeah. the time, they were absolutely huge, and and their songs were fantastic, especially yeah. Oasis. And yeah. uh, funny thing, I lived, I used to live on Abbey Road in London. Really? Um, uh, yes, I, I don't know if I, I, I used to live on Abbey Road, and um, mm -hmm. there was a shop just along the road. Yeah. And uh, Abbey Road Studios was maybe a quarter of a mile down. It's a long road, Abbey Road, mm -hmm. maybe a quarter of a mile. 20 minute walk and um, there was the shop and I walked in and the vocalist of Oasis was in there you oh, know the true. guy who has this reputation for being and he was the nicest guy you know yeah um, I think it's Liam Liam was the singer Liam and, Gallagher uh, yeah Gallagher again the again. Gallagher brothers <laughs> again yeah, yeah. so um, I mean great you know it's it's uh, Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart yeah. produced some fantastic stuff. I mean, yeah. No More I Love Yous by Annie Lennox yeah. is a spectacular work of I, I, I love the, I love the song. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, killer. Wasn't that recorded uh, it's, in, it's, in a church in London? I, I heard about they had a studio, like in an old church that they converted into a record studio. Maybe, I, yeah, but, but, th well, but this, this was before uh, that song. There's two, there's two studios in London. One, Dave Stewart opened a studio. I can't remember what, I think, I think it's called The Church. I think yeah. it's called Church Studios. I think so, yeah. And Dave Stewart opened that. But Air Studios yeah, in North London yeah, was the studio that George Martin opened and Jeff Beck yeah, yeah. recorded Wired and Blow by Blow in there. Yeah. And... Um, there's some extraordinarily good music has come out of Air Studios. There's no doubt about that. Um, both old churches, yeah, great records. And Abbey Road, of course, which is, um, I mean, I think, I, I don't know how many studios are actually left in London now. There used to be studios everywhere in London and pubs. A, yeah. a friend of mine, yeah. um, a friend of mine, Robin, who, who, who's a taxi driver in London, said that he was on an, a road in London called Upper Street, yeah. which is in Islington. And all yeah. of our London friends will know exactly where I'm talking about. 
And he said on one night, yeah. Dire Straits, Elvis Costello and the police were playing in pubs on one night. Wow, cool. So yeah. you could walk into this pub and see the police, walk into that pub and see Dire Straits and walk into that pub and see Elvis Costello. Yeah. And the record companies were all buzzing around these pubs, talking to the managers at the bar, having a drink, preparing deals to sign these guys up and they all become multi-million selling mm. superstars. Yeah. None of those pubs put live music on anymore. Yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. But, uh, yeah. you know, um, and this was then maybe in the 70s, 80s? When was that? 70, 76, 77. Ah, 76, that, that, that was the time. Yeah, before they got big. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, I assume that the time before that, like 10 years ago, 66, this was the big time when like the Stones and whatever, Jimi yeah. Hendrix and the Beatles and the Who did the same thing in London. Oh, small, yeah. Yeah. you know, starting small and then, you know, grow and become international with all the, you know, yeah. uh, big festivals and uh, Woodstock and kind of this. Wow. So, hey, um, yeah, this, uh, f for me, I, I can see that the problem that this kind of scene is not there anymore and i'm yeah. very happy that people like you just still you know live that kind of music in the real deal way you know it's not like yeah. compromise and you know do something just to make money no it's like you do mm -hmm. the real deal as a musician and mm -hmm. and it's 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 not only art it's a spirit it's uh, it's something we have to preserve somehow you know you know, I, I played pop bands like Tic Tac Toe here in Germany and we, we were kind of the German Spice Girls and I played big stages, but I quit the whole industry just mm. because of that, because, you know, it's about the real deal music and not about yeah. uh, money. It's, it's not about mm -hmm. fame. Uh, anyway, I wasn't fam famous in that, uh, at that time anyhow. It was all about the girls. But, um, of course. Yeah, yeah. But and everything else. And yeah. everything else. But hey, give a yeah. fuck, you know. And <laughs> but you know, I heard that you played one day with um, Raoul Walton, uh, a bass player yeah. that I play with for ages. I met the guy yes. when I was I don't know in my twenties, early twenties, when I was mm -hmm. very young. And mm -hmm. um, and that there's a story how you came along and got an M1. Yeah. What, what's that story? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, R Raoul <coughs> is a wonderful bass player. Um, and, um, killer. Guy from I, New York. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And I, and I, and I look forward to um, hopefully doing some more stuff with him when this crazy situation changes. But yeah. um, we, were, we had a gig in Munich and uh, Raoul said, I was trying to borrow an amp. And there's a guy got an amp hire company in Munich, who's also a nice guy, very friendly guy, a lot of old vintage marshals and so on. And, um, and Raoul said, yeah, give Thomas Blug a call, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, 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 what happened? There's a guy in Munich had an amp one and mm -hmm. he loaned me it. He mm -hmm. loaned me the amp. And Raoul said, if you like it, call Thomas. And that's, that's basically led us to, the, to where we are now. Yeah. You know, this is where we are. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And um, if we had a little um, voting for um, people that what, what would you like to hear from you? You do mm -hmm. also regular live streams. Do we have any spe specific dates? I, I, Sunday is yes. probably one or can you tell? Sunday night, it's, it, if, if you're in Germany, yeah. Sunday night would be eight o'clock, acht Uhr. Ach, uh, Uhr, 20 yeah. Uhr. Yes, 20 <laughs> yeah. Uhr. Uh, seven o'clock in the UK, which is 2 p.m. in New York and 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And then I'll kind of do what I call like a little impromptu show during the week, maybe like Tuesday, Wednesday morning. So people in Australia or in other, uh, other time zones who can't catch the Sunday show can tune in. Mm -hmm. um, if you search Paul Rowe's guitar on Google, or I'm sure uh, Thomas, you find. with Harry and everybody yeah. there, you've got links, and, and I'm, I'm easy found, yeah. I think. Yeah, we got some here under our stream, mm -hmm. but I mean, even if you go just on YouTube or uh, follow uh, Paul Rose's Facebook page, you 
you, you know, there's tons of links to, to follow up. But the thing about Paul is, from my point of view, there is there are some great guitar players on the planet, but there's only one Paul Rose. And the Paul Rose, I can feel your heart when you play. And that's, uh, you know, it's deep. I love it. Oh, well. Hey, we had we had a um, we had a, a, a voting of three songs, and mm -hmm. they all want to hear you to play a blues. Play blues. So, right. do you have a blues for us? Just I've got a blues right here. I'm just about to press the button. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say to to the audience that that we are here? Well, here? I love the amp one. I love the Thomas Blue Gamp one, and I'm not saying that because I'm you know that I don't use things unless I love them. I can't use things mm -hmm. that aren't. That, I've 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 compromised with equipment in the past, and so the the the, the blue gear, the LSL guitars, uh, it's it's great gear. I'm enormously grateful for um, the opportunity to talk to you and to reach your audience around the world, Thomas. And I know you've got quite a substantial following of people who appreciate what you're doing. Uli Roth, who's one of the greatest guitar yeah. players I've ever seen in my life. Um, I saw him in Newcastle and he blew me away. I think he's probably one of the best players I've ever seen. So um, it's it's great to be here and, and uh, I hope people will join me on Facebook and YouTube and do what you do well, be yourself and everything will work out. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. Hey, thanks Paul. Thanks Thank for joining. Pleasure. And we, we might have you, have you, have you back Uh, later this Anytime. year, whenever we have some some topics, you know things things will appear. We are connected. Yeah. That's super cool. So, if you, you know, yeah, enjoy Paul Rose and his blues in what is it? A. C minor. Oh. You want to play along? Oh. <laughs> ah, hey, yes. okay. The, the so, blues Thomas, I'm going to take this ear thing out, so I'll not be able to hear you speak when I do that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Bye bye. I'm, I can't hear anything.
Great Mr. Paul Rose. <laughs> Okay, um, we did have some requests for tones. How can we get tones? Tones from our heroes. And um, I've chosen two for today. One is Stevie Ray Vaughan and the other one is ACDC, Angus or Ma Malcolm Young, uh, whatever. And um, yeah, so I've done a setup here with my AB switcher. Maybe you can see that one. So, which amp do we hear? It's, um, <laughs> yeah, look at. The amp one. And this amp. Um, anyway, so you can see I'm using 
those amps side by side. And with this setup, I have no pedals included. They are all aside. So this goes in the switcher, A, B. Um, there's amp one and there's the fender. And this is... done to be that close for both amps. So this is a mid-60s, I don't know the year, it's a probably 64 Fender Bassman. It's slightly, uh, I wouldn't say modded, uh, it's just made in a way that it sounds the way it should sound, optimized. So it's a pretty uh, good Fender Bassman amp and um, I chose that one because my Super Reverb Reverb was not in shape that uh, that well today. You know, good old tube amps, they have um, their days. This was the winner of today. Okay, I can't see it now. I can only tell by the reverb <laughs> which amp I'm playing, actually. So, um, if you uh, look into Stevie Ray Vaughan and what uh, is his sound recipe, um, you know, people talk about the tube screamer and everything, but I haven't actually used that yet. Um, I know that Stevie Ray Vaughan is a Texas blues guy and he grew up on Fender amps. And uh, what we're hearing right now is this Fender amp using uh, the blue box and I'm using the Black 410 speaker cabinet which is actually my Super Reverb cabinet. So that's something that I kind of um, think sounds pretty SRV-ish in a way as a cabinet. Um, we can listen to other cabinets. That's not that cup of tea. So here in the Fender ballpark. This is a 210. <laughs> Somehow the 4x10 is, is my choice. Um, anyway, so that's the speaker um, model that I used for both amps. Um, and now, what is the recipe that you need to get to Stevie Ray Vaughan sound? Basically, he used loud amps. Everything is cranked. When you look on the amp one here, you can see the settings. The master is at seven. Uh, the clean is on like 8 or 9 even. I use the boost, but I have the boost all the way down. So the, the, the boost is not giving me extra gain. It's only a little bit of sparkle and a little bit of extra... Uh, it's just a touch of a push. It's The whole concept for this tone is to drive the entire amp as hard in every stage. It's not kind of uh, saturating the front, the preamp only and having the power amp low. No, it's kind of crank the amp and get the tubes cooking. This is what I've done on the Fender. See, this is at nine. If I put that on 10, it's a bit uh, muddy, 
But if I put that, I, I, I can show you. <laughs> So this is like the concept for the tone. Get a loud screaming power amp and then with that kind of foundation you can add pedals and stuff. And the way Stevie was doing it live, I can tell you since I've been to this particular concert here. Um, was my experience with Stevie Ray Vaughan being in the front of the stage he played some Fender amps a, a whole bunch of Fender amps and he played a half stack Marshall and it was a major Marshall I'm talking about this is a 200 watts Marshall and it's the cleanest Marshall they've ever built KT88 tubes 200 watts so this is as loud as it gets and for the encore he he was lifting something that was in front of the speakers so it became even louder than uh, during the show and my ears were bleeding I tell you that's that kind of uh, uh, um, yeah standing just a few meters away from the so the, the setup of Stevie Ray Vaughan is a combination of several loud clean amps and he's also famous for using a dumbbell amplifier the steel stringer and I played some dumbbells in the past um, as we all know dumbbells are slightly different each model is kind of customized for the player but they have one thing in common they are pretty solid and they have you know a very tight tone and then he's using EV speakers you know electro voice 12 L speakers which are 12 inch speakers that give you 200 watts with a super heavy magnet so this is kind of about the the tightest 12 inch that I've ever played I used to have one of those in my early days I have to admit that I personally mm, I'm not that kind of guy that wants to play first that loud and secondly, the EV speaker is too controlled for me, for my personal taste. I'm, I mean, I love Stevie Ray Vaughan and I like the stuff that he's doing, but at a certain point I develop my own tone and my own style and I found out that I go for like Greenback speakers, which have 25 watts, which is kind of the opposite of what Stevie Ray Vaughan was using. But um, it's good to be aware that there are several choices and directions that you can go and you have to know if you want to go Stevie there's a cooking recipe okay what I have done with the amp one just for you that you know what I've done is I used it with the remote just to dial in the same amount of um, power since the amp one has like a hundred watts in the power amp stage and the basement whatever 50 or 40 watts only maybe 60 depending on the plate voltage um, and since I'm using power amp saturation um, I have to find the sweet spot where both amps have equal power it's the same power is only then you can compare it if I reduce the you know it, it wouldn't be fair any dB in power is also tone so there is uh, so this is why I had to start here and the rest is is fairly simple I used all the mids you know and I used some treble like in the middle position I used on the amp one literally no bass um, to come close to the sound and um, yeah this this basement is also uh, a little bit tightened up so it's it has the bass instrument channel um, which I'm not using I'm using the normal channel to get this kind of nice spanky Stevie Ray Vaughan sound 
Um, so that's, that's the basic concept. A lot of mids, natural trouble, not so much bass, and then anything that drives the power amp stage and the pre amp stage and get everything just clean on the edge of breaking up and cooking. So this is what I learned from looking at Steve Raywan tones. And then of course he had a wah-wah with oh, I mean the wrong amp. Yeah, but anyway, um, I'm playing in standard tuning. This is 440 and it's uh, not drop uh, the way he does it. And I play my regular strings, which is 940. Six, uh, so it's a mixed set of nines and tenth. Um, of course, he is famous for using even thirteens. Later, then he kind of reduced to elevens. Uh, but strings also make a lot of difference. But you know, for me, it's like I want to get a Stevie Ray Vaughan tone with my setup. Of course, if you want to go all the way, then you can go and have um, your know, thirteens on the on the guitar. I would then think it would be better to reduce the gain a bit because you have more um, punch coming from the guitar, which gives you an extra load. And um, this will, I would change the volume on the amp one or on the Fender just to have, to make sure that there is not too much bass coming. So it's, it's about finding the sweet spot where you load all the stages perfectly but don't get too much low end. And playing thicker strings at a lower pitch, of course you can say it's a man's thing, yeah, bending and blah, blah, blah. But um, it also is a playing thing because um, the pick will brush through the strings easily. Uh, easily. <laughs> So the pick that I'm using today is a worn out pick, which makes it easier to play that way uh, in, on my guitar with like these kind of thin, uh, thinner strings. Okay, um, I will now plug in some of the other things here, which could be this, I could use the, the line here with the, ah, uh, fuck, my good old tube screamer input socket is kind of busted. Ah, let's start with this pedal here. So, okay, we are on the M1. Sorry. <laughs> to me, they sound so similar, I have to double check with the reverb, which, which one I'm... <laughs> So this is all pedals on bypass and now let's see what this beauty old tube screamer can do with that tone. So. You know what, I, let me get the, the reflex out of the way for a minute before, before we get to this. Ah, fuck. I have a bit more room. So here's the, the good old tube scale. Yeah, there's a clear mid hump. You know, it's a... The little green frog, I would call that. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. If you listen to the Fender amps itself, um, it's something like they have kind of scoop mids in a, in a way. And that's why I even put the mids all up on, on, the, on the amp one to get this kind of, yeah, woodiness in the tone. And this tube screamer, 
has a bass roll off and then you can um, have the, you, you, you can use the tone control to kind of get rid of too much high end. <laughs> thing I learned is you have to dig in hard if 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 you are just you know too nice to your strings then you never get to that Stevie Ray Vaughan spank <laughs> For Lenny, it's even better without a tube screamer, <laughs> in a way. He has this kind of super spark. Driving the amp. But Stevie used the tube screamer with no gain. So he, it's more like a clean boost, anyhow. I'm using the internal boost of Amp1, and I think it sounds even better than the tube screamer, in a way. Eh, whatever, my, my setup. That sounds pretty good. In combination. Yeah, I need a tube screamer. Okay, there's another pedal uh, from Vertex, and um, Mason Marangella is the guy behind Vertex, and he's very keen on getting. Dumble sounds, you know. Dumble is, you know, that famous most expensive amplifier ever, and um, this is the steel string. What is it? Slight return version. Uh, well, SRV. It's very close to Stevie Ray Vaughan. Let's see what that pedal can do for us. <laughs> It's some extra grittiness in case if that's the amp, amp one by itself. That's the steel. Mm -hmm. 
So hey, the in I'm torn between the built-in boost of the M1 and the steel string. They both have their own qualities. So the built-in one has a bit more sparkle. You know? string much. yeah well in that case I like that pedal I bought it um, but I think the pedal is better if you have an amp that is cleaner. So my amp already is kind of so well saturated that uh, the extra steel string boost is not doing any good for this setup here. Um, but it's a cool pedal, I love it. I bought it myself because I was deeply impressed and that's a very handy pedal if you have an amp that is totally clean and then you get this kind of little dirt from the pedal. I could fake this, ah, I could kill my setting. See, now the amp is totally clean. And now I get the grid from this pedal. Okay, so this is how to get there with a regular amp, the steel string um, by Vertex. I will reduce the volume again a tiny little bit. That's the way it needs to breathe. of like the built-in boost with the extra sparkle that I get. Okay, um, then there is the story which is probably true that Stevie used two tube screamers stacked and of course that makes sense because you have an extra push, um, output push. He was not too keen on getting overdrive from the pedals. It was just pushing the amp even harder. So you have this, that and more. And then uh, behind the cabinets here is, is a wah-wah pedal. Wow, 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 wow,
This is all done with a power. Oh, I got the amp, the fan is going now. First time ever. <laughs> but you know, I've been on eight. So this is how loud the amp one gets in the studio. And um, yeah, it's cooling down. And we have a super hot day today here. I'm not wearing any shoes <laughs> and my shorts, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, and we are under the roof. And this was the end of the fan. Thank you. Um, Okie dog. Another effect that Stevie was using in the studio, which goes back for uh, Jimi Hendrix inspired moments, was a Leslie, a real Leslie. And maybe you know that I was involved in this tube Leslie project with Jusen Kettner back in the days, I think it was whoop, 1995 or a long time ago. So let's go here, check that and get the pedal. I got too many cables. So I hope this is an input. This one is stereo, so I need the input for mono. Okay. Uh, you know what? Get rid of those guys and here we go <laughs> so this is um bypass <laughs> pedal. I love it. Um, so this is modeled after the real Leslie, I don't know what's the cabinet number, 200. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It was heavy, it was made from wood that tall, it had the real belt and it had you know the two, the horn and the big speaker and the tube amp built in and so this pedal is probably still the, the closest thing you can get. There's some other great modeling uh, of a, uh, yeah, a Leslie cabinet, since the effect is very complex, that's an analog attempt, which is um, it's very unique and it sounds very warm. And you can see the two rotors um, speeding up and slowing down even individually. So the red one is the low frequency and the green one is for the, the high frequency. And maybe you can see that the red one slows down uh, slower and that the, the, the green one speeds up faster. So that's all important for that sound. And the two holes are so you can um, kind of dial in the maximum speed of each of the rotors. So the, the rotor on the old Leslie's, um, they were driven by a belt. And when the belt was kind of um, worn out, the, the belt was not speeding up um, the same speed like when they were new. And this is what made all the Leslie's unique. So anyway, that's a, I love it. Effect is also super important um, for those classic moments. And of course, we have a song that 
uses that Leslie effect not only with Stevie Ray, it was also it was a cover that I liked a lot from Stevie Ray Warren, but the original one is Jimi Hendrix. I know you know it, so here it comes. <laughs> Maybe a few hints about that song. Um, in my past, I was also writing some articles about the music um, of Jimi Hendrix. And this is, by the way, the lead sheet for Little Wing. So, can you see that? The chords? Very nice. So, please look at the chords. And now we have the big question. What scale can we use to solo over it? And this will take the next three days <laughs> as we have too many options for that. But I would like to show you a few um, ideas. Ah, here. Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course, was a fan of Little Wing. And um, every guitar player has its own recipe. But most guitar players have the same recipe, which is the minor pentatonic, which is... That, that scale, okay? Um, and of course, Stevie... Uh, It's a problem because 
we have a B minor chord. I'm talking about regular tuning now. And you can play a B minor pentatonic here. Uh, you could still play the E minor pentatonic over the B, you know, like... But you can also play the B minor pentatonic. And this is what Stevie Ray was doing, and Hendrix maybe too. Um, and then there's this kind of chromatic down here. The way Stevie plays it, I think, is like another minor chord, back down to the A minor. Um, I heard something from Hendrix like B minor, uh, sorry, yeah, B minor, B flat, uh, sus4, major, down to A minor. Okay, and if you do this kind of chromatic thing, that opens up a new dimension where you can go crazy, where you can go either chromatic licks or you go crazy scales. Like you think about, okay, there's a B minor and there's a B flat minor and there's an A minor. And then you can go and each chord with its own uh, minor pentatonic. But if you have that chord in the middle, the B major sus4, this is actually a G minor scale that I would play over that because B flat major is the parallel of G minor. So I would play B minor. Minor, or it is, and then A minor. minor. That that's K. Okay, that's a tricky part, or whatever. Is it a tricky part? It's a part that you can make very colorful with scales if you are into that. If you stay on your regular E minor pentatonic through the whole song, you do nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong about that. I'm just outlining a few ideas how to get, you know, somewhere else. Talking about somewhere else, in the harmony progression, we have this uh, G major, F major. And what has that to do with E minor pentatonic? Well, G major is, is clear because G major is the major parallel of E minor, but the F major, what's that? F major, the parallel would be D minor. And then the C major and D. What I'm saying is on the F chord, you can go crazy again. Either you play D minor pentatonic, which is the parallel minor pentatonic of the F major chord, or you think about the whole thing is like the F chord goes into the C chord, and then you think about, hey, you know what? I make the whole thing C major because I already think of C major. It's like. We come from the G major and over this F chord. The next chord that follows is the C major. So we use C major for those two chords. And then the tricky part is the D major chord. And you are fucked with the C major scale because that makes no sense. So you have to move it up. To a D major scale, and a D major scale is an E Dorian scale, which is again the E minor pentatonic plus a, um, what is it? The 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 six, not the flat six, the regular six, and the two or nine. Okay, this was tons of intervals. Let's put it that way. Either you go. 
pentatonic, E minor pentatonic, all the way, option one. Or you go G major, which is half of the turnaround of you know all the chords. It's G major, fantastic. Then when it goes to the B minor, you can go A major or B mm, Dorian. <laughs> then you can go half step down or you play G. Then on the A, I would already go, I would already go um, pure C major for A minor, C, G, F, C. All these chords would be C major for me. And then just for the last chord, I would move it up, oh, up to D major again. Okay, that was a quick <laughs> but very intense lesson about harmony and music theory on Little Wing. And talking about sounds, the sounds of notes, not only from amplifiers, but the sounds of tones and the right choice of notes can also define a lot in your playing. Um, okay, doc, we have got some questions here. One question is here, um, Nick, from the background of British rock here, can we look forward to some Peter Green and Gary Moore, Les Paul tones? Yes, that's a good thing. That's um, something I would love to do in the future. Let's do that. Peter Green is a tasty British player and of course his guitar ended up at Gary Moore and he did some tasty stuff with that guitar. So that's, that's a good one, yeah. Um, what is it, uh, the next question? Um, the way where does the guitar sound come from? As Thomas is using the blue box, is it connected to some PA cap? Audio interface, sure, yeah. So this XLR out is going into our audio interface mixing board, which is what you hear. And this is what I get through a tiny little monitor. <laughs> yeah, and um, that's what we got here with um, the blue box, that's all. Um, so this was some insights on the Stevie Ray Vaughan sound. We, we should know that Stevie had a bunch of different guitars and a bunch of different amps. And uh, of course he had his number one, which I heard was 59 pickups, so-called black bottom Fender pickups. The later years had gray bottom pickups. They sound not as steelish, bright in a way, so th the way that he, he has this <laughs> spanking uh, sound, that's, that's a 59 uh, or a black bottom Fender pickup sound. And I heard he had the 61 as well. Where's my 61? Oh, it's downstairs today. No 61, um, doesn't matter. But so I know how these pickup sounds that he used to play. And I heard rumors that his guitar was made of, of a whatever, 62 body and a 63 neck. So it was kind of a, a guitar that was put together from different bits and pieces, old ones. And some of those guitars are magic. Like um, Eric Clapton's Blackie was also uh, a blend of different parts from vintage guitars. And that's what the old guys did in the past. They bought like three guitars and they, they kind of took the neck from that guitar because they liked it best and tried out which body suits the best and then swapped the pickups and whatever was their cup of tea, uh, this was their way of optimizing the instrument. This is kind of custom shop, custom shop yourself. Um, yeah, and then I heard the story that his neck got trashed and he, he need, needed to replace the neck, um, that's for sure. 
and I've seen pictures of him using lipstick pickups and that's something I had too like 15 years ago I had a Strat with lipsticks and I can hear that guitar on some Stevie Ray Vaughan records as well. So this was my Stevie Ray Vaughan attempt for today. If you have more questions please let me know. Um, no questions at this point? Okay, nobody likes TV Ray Vaughan but me. Um, before I move on to the ACDC section, I wanted to show you a few more of these beautiful boosters. And last episode we talked about this one from Alex, um, Guitar Slinger, which is the RB1011. And being some kind of preamp from the Iwa tape machine. And here we have the Model Galaxy 1011 from BSM, Bernd Meiser. Um, and yesterday, just before today, I was visiting Bernd Meiser and he is Mr. Treble Booster. And Bernd has all the insights. He knows Treble Boosters, and all that stuff more than anybody else because he has been to all that, these concerts, he has uh, you know, looked into every detail of every schematic of, he took photos, he took interviews and he, he, he got the complete pictures of that. So, and he told me Richie was using um, something which was the Hornby Skews HS Treble Booster. So that's not the original design of the, um, where is it, Range Master from last time. The Range Master is out there. Somebody get me the Range Master for a sec, please. Um, yeah. So, which camera are we on? Still this one? Okay. Um, so here's the point. This is the Range Master and it's using OC44, at least I think in this one. Um, and the Hornby's Q's um, has even less bass, which, which is kind of a very yeah, a very trebly, even more trebly unit. But for certain sounds, that's, that's required. You need to, to, to get even more uh, trebly with this one to get um, to, to specific Blackmore tones. And talking about Blackmore, this was Bernd Meiser's attempt for the 1011 preamp of the Iwa. So we could make an AB one. We do that another time. I will invite Bernd uh, with all his pedals so we can have a, a full treble booster show. And now I'd like to uh, move on to my next amp sound, which is Angus Young, ACDC. So, switch off the fender. Plug in the Marshall. Heat it up. Switch the guitar. Uh, so. And I will start, oops. And of course, hey, get rid of all that pedals because he was not a big pedal user. He was using something else. He was using his backpack. And what was the secret in his backpack? 
what was inside the backpack? Well, Angus Young was using a wireless system. And this wireless system was part of his tone. So we know that he was playing Marshalls, Super Leads and GTMs uh, and whatever. Huge collection of Marshall. Marshall, any Marshall. And uh, I heard that he has got his own tech on the road um, just to make sure every of these amps is in perfect condition. And um, he doesn't have any effects. He doesn't have a delay pedal. He doesn't use a wah wah pedal. He doesn't use a tube screamer. But he used that wireless. And I heard the story that he was uh, in the studio with Matt Lang, the very famous producer, and that he was not feeling right in the studio. And he was asked like, hey, wh what's wrong? Why, why don't you feel like on stage and stuff like this? And they, they tried to find out. And then Angus told him, well, on stage I play my wireless. And then, uh-huh. The producer said, maybe you should try to play the wireless in the studio as well. And the story says that was the secret of the moment. So they used the wireless and he's got his tone back. But let's start the, the basic recipe of um, ACDC. Let's start with a good crank Marshall because the amps that he's using, they didn't have master volumes. They had... Oh, okay. Ouch. So, I know reverb. Uh, maybe we use another cabinet as well. Ah, no Marshall. Marshall is here. So this now is my GTM 45 on the well bright channel, and um, it doesn't have a master volume, so it's cranked. And this is. This guitar is my 335, which is not the guitar that he's using, but this guitar has the kind of pickups that he's using. It's uh, T model pickups, and these pickups were used in Gibson guitars after uh, the PAF models, you know, the one with the black sticker that says per tent applied for. Um, on the bobbins, you see this kind of little T, and this. Um, yeah, they used these pickups in, I'm not the expert, but you know, 60s, maybe into 70s. And these pickups have, have their own character. Uh... Ah, sorry, I'm on the Marshall.
That's the Marshall. <laughs> So that's the M1. Um, let's put it that way. My GDM45 has a very worn out rectifier tube. So the zagging is a bit too much. Um, yeah. I do have other marshals, but I was too lazy and I didn't prepare right for this episode, to be honest. I took this amp, put it on and thought it would work. It's okay, but I think I should Go for my black flag one in my collection, the 100 watt. Um, anyway, we have a reference, so what you can hear is this is a real deal vintage Marshall 1965 GTM45 trying to make a nice ACDC sound. That's the one. And that's my amp one. Okay, not bad. Um, so we haven't heard this fellow here. Let's see what that can do for us. Uh, we need a patch cable. Bingo. So, uh, which amp I'm in? Yeah, this one. Power in, out, and this is input now. Sounds a bit fuzzy to me. It's maybe not fair. You know what? I get rid of the switching system. But very briefly, I switch to the Marshall to see if that combination is. Ah, doesn't work because it's in front of the amp one. Uh, how can we do that? I simply plug that into the guitar first and then into the switcher and then wait a minute it's getting complicated here um, where is the guitar input is I can't read upside down instrument okay and here goes the socket so this is input Switcher input. Ah. Okay, that 
sounds pretty good. So, I'm back on the M1 since my Marshall is not... Uh, that's the Marshall. But I like the M1 better because the Marshall is... Too fuzzy, okay? Let's go for the amp one. And you know what? Now I go straight into the amp and have just the pedal. Pedal, no switching. You know, be as puristic as can be. That's sometimes important. So, and. <laughs> So what we hear now is there's the certain mid density. Call it as more rock. You know what? I see a SG over there which comes from the local music shop. And try this one. Um, so that's a brand new guitar. Six and four around the corner gave me that guitar. And getting into the ballpark. The right guitar. And I think that's the trick. Everything full, if I play soft with a pick, it's simply clean. hit hard, then I have finally that rock and roll tone. Listen just by the amp, by, by the amp itself, you can hear that this kind of treble booster, which is a modification inside the wireless of Angus Young, is giving, giving you more definition. I can try to mimic this with my amp one. Just the M1, but yeah, that booster is that booster, and that 
there's a certain rah, nastiness about that one, which I actually like. So, you know, there's the last 5% you get from little toys like that. And um, if you wonder why you don't get 100% to that tone, well, it's all about the recipe. And this guitar has now tens on it. I know that uh, Angus is playing thinner strings, uh, which would be nines to 42 even. Um, yeah, and that changes again the bass. So this will be a brighter sound, a thinner sound, a more transparent sound. And combined with this kind of thickening setup, that's, I believe, more expressive. So I'm, I'm a fan of well, all kinds of strings, but um, for rock, sometimes thinner strings are the magic. <laughs> By the way, this is the only song that ACDC played an F chord. Most of their songs don't use that chord because it sounds shit. They use... And this is fucking all you need to do some great rock and roll. cabinet so this is a green bag and um, if you the, the ACDC secret is they had two guitar players and one was uh, Angus was using the vintage uh, no Angus was using the green bags and Malcolm was using the vintage 30s and so they had similar stuff but slightly different and um, Malcolm with the Gretsch and you know it's just a slightly different tone and this is the way how to make a band sound great and that's ACDC are masters of doing the real band sound they know how to groove they know how to play straight eight you know <laughs> Here you can hear it's about the cabinets again. If, if you have the right kind of cabinet for the tone, you are in the right ballpark. Okay, and the fan is going on at eight. Okay, I have to admit, I'm playing very, very loud. Um, on stage, you wouldn't survive that. That's, that's a full 100 watts, but this is what the guys have actually done. And that's part of rock and roll, being loud. The good thing about Amp1 is it has a built-in power soak. There is a low power mode that can get the wattage down to half power, which is like 50, 60 watt. And you get the same tone at a lower volume because that's what we regular guys um, are using in our reality. So, um, 
Any more questions? Alex Guitar Fan, please could you demonstrate to us how Ron has influenced any of your own phrases and licks in your own uh, music? Yeah. Um, I will very quickly go back for a strat or this strat. Um, yeah, my 61 is not here. It doesn't matter. You will see it next. <laughs> And I will go back for my sound, my personal sounds you see, so we will see my reference tone in a second. <laughs> ah, I like the booster even with the strat. It the difference is tiny, but you know for tone it's it is it is something like Every little bit of spices adds to a delicious tone. So these pedals make a difference. Okay, Stevie has influenced me, yes, of course. And the way he influenced me was two things. One thing is to dig in the deep in the strings. Like Okay, you can hear my sound now is way more overdriven than Stevie's sound, but... So all this attempt and all this punch is coming from, you know, this Albert King, Stevie Ray Vaughan roots. And the other thing is, you know, if you... If you Phrasing. So what he has done, there's a few licks like it's is it simple or is it difficult? I'm it's hard to tell. Um, I'm brushing through the strings like and then of course this. play one note and it's, it's kind of you fret all the other notes without having the the pick hitting every note it's like you hit the first note high and the rest is just a you know a, a nice blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and that's cool I, I stole that from from Stevie and um, I think I stole some of his energy. The way he plays is like unbelievable. It's like he... With my sound, you can hear me, <laughs> but there's still some Stevie left in, in the phrasing. I combine the whole thing with others elements. You know, like <laughs> that's a classical uh, arpeggio Stevie wouldn't have played, but and I combine it with my little <laughs> shredding attempt. Give me. More. <laughs> But here's you know one element, and there's some other element. And Stevie give me the roughness, the roughness, and of course also the. I need more reverb. So, in my world. I like the soft parts a lot. And Stevie has done the same thing too. In my world, it's just when I start with a soft part, I have more gain left at the end and I become like 
a bit more shreddy in my style at the end. But in the middle range, there's a lot of similarities here and there. Okay, that's the question. Um, Kaiser Franz, what brand and kind uh, of strings do you use? Grüße aus Unterfranken. There's my strings on the shelf. These are these strings is what I'm using. Um, they are here on the shelf just in case I break one. Um, it is Ernie Ball Hybrid Slinkies reinforced plain strings, and the, the gauge is nine to forty six, and the RPS is reinforced because the first version of the same strings, the uh, the Hybrid Slinkies, they were breaking like crazy. And I had to change strings way too often. And these have a very, very similar sound, but they last a lot longer. So I trust these strings on my guitar. And I got used to the sound of these strings, so now it's very hard for me to play anything else. Okay, one more question. Uh, future episodes, maybe Thomas can try to get some slash tones. Yes, I can try. I've done an episode on this um, guitar magazine in Germany where I analyzed Slash um, a little bit. I'm not the super Slash connoisseur, but um, I can try and that's a good hint. Thanks for um, yeah, getting these demands. I will make a list of new stuff to come. And I think that's it for today. We already have done another two hours again. <laughs> Very long streams. Um, you could see live now that a Marshall is a Marshall, a Fender is a Fender, and they are beautiful amps, but they have to be also the right amps to be perfect. I have to admit, I love my GTM 45, but it was not the best choice for the ACDC today. It, it was too squashed. Uh, it needs to have a tighter rectifier uh, or at least a diet rectifier uh, even though Malcolm played GTM 45s 100s as a rhythm guitar player um, but I know this amp can sound like that with a different rectifier tube so sorry for not preparing a hundred percent maybe I come back one one day later <laughs> and do it but now I know I should have taken my Black Flag Marshall uh, in the unmodified version, which is downstairs. Um, but you could see how I approach these sounds. And it's when you understand the recipe of the sounds, you can recreate them and get very close to a sound that you have in your head or a sound, sound that you want to copy. And there are little tiny boxes like those treble boosters. And of course, it's it's the mixture of everything. It's the mixture of the right guitar with the right pickups, with maybe a pedal, the right settings, and the right speaker cabinet too. And only if everything is perfect, you can nail the tone. So this is the one for today. Thanks again to Paul Rose for joining this episode. Hope to see you next week on our next stream number 11. Cheers, take care, bye.